I am not a fan of the Houthis. I would like to make that very clear <laughs> at the outset. What I am is impressed by the Houthis and troubled by the Houthis, uh, getting to the point where I'm a little terrified by the Houthis. Hello and welcome to the More Freedom Foundation podcast, the only podcast that has the freedom to be honest. I am joined, as always, by the wonderful Robert Morris, who will guide us through today's political world. How are you this week? Uh, not bad. How are you doing today, Rory? Yeah, I'm doing well. Just working away. I'm just a bit uh, upset. Did you hear the, oh, yeah? the, 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 the big news? The portal no. has been turned off. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. I'd vaguely heard about this. This was a it was a portal. Was it between New York and where, or somewhere else? And Dublin. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's essentially just a live stream that would feed, like you know, one stream from Dublin to New York and vice versa. But uh, but it's sort of in, in a central square, and you could like you could, yes, the, the public could interact with each other from city to city. Very uh, very 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 sci-fi. Uh, the only problem is that. You can uh, essentially people can get to the camera. So mm -hmm. I know on the Irish side they were putting up offensive stuff to America for like nine eleven and stuff. And on the American side, I think a woman that only sells fans uh, mm -hmm. was uh, promoting herself through it. So uh, ah, it has been I shut see. down for the time being. I see. I see. It's, <laughs> it was a great idea until until the public was allowed to. Yes. Uh, Apparently, the part of Dublin it's in is a bit rough. So I don't know exactly why they chose there, but. So, yes. Hopefully that's all the bad news for today on oh, this I'm episode, sure. Rob. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. It's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking to to, to uh, rob the public of that avenue of communication. Exactly. Uh, but um, hopefully it'll reopen. I, I didn't go down and check it out. Hopefully it'll come back and I can give it a whirl. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, is there anything you'd like to talk about this week? Any good news to cheer us all uh, today, up? Today, I want... Well, it's not really good news, no. I mean, it's good news for some people, and it's profoundly ambiguous uh, news for a lot of people. Uh, but today, I want to talk about the Houthis and just how absurdly successful they have been. I think it's kind of strange, actually, that we haven't discussed the Houthis in any detail. I think it's common for a lot of people to see them as a weird outlier. They're this crazy Iran-sponsored militia in Yemen. So many things wrong with that sentence I just said there. Doesn't really have much application anywhere else. But I think that a really troubling thing about the Houthis is that they could actually be a, a, a pretty heavy indication or harbinger of what's to come, uh, especially, and I think we'll talk about this next episode, if you think, as I do, that we've got a new Arab Spring coming, the idea that Houthis or Houthi-like elements could be a big part of the next iteration of Arab uprisings is pretty profoundly troubling. Uh, so I think it's worth spending a whole episode looking at the Houthis, what they are, how they came about and uh, what their impact has been. And perhaps a uh, rather important undersold uh, a bit is that uh, they're, they're kind of winning. They're just going from strength to strength to victory to victory to the point where you can now kind of include the United States under Joe Biden as uh, one of the vanquished. And we'll talk about that a bit more as we go on. So I think the thing that I've noticed the most about the Houthis is the fact that nobody's noticing them at the moment. They seem to <laughs> basically take on the whole world of shipping, create this mm -hmm. big massive scene. But yet, sadly, we're still focusing on the horrors that are happening in Gaza, while the Houthis have largely been forgotten as a sort of side note of this conflict. Well, I think part of it is that it's so embarrassing. I think that there's a lot of the United States is very invested in this idea of our military superiority. We keep the sea lanes safe. And the fact that we've blown up a bunch of stuff in Yemen, that's happened. I assume that's continuing to happen. But we haven't actually managed to deal with the threat. Uh, my understanding is that the, the Houthi attacks have slowed a little bit, but they have not stopped. And their threat to shipping through the Red Sea is very much maintained, which means that nobody can insure the ships, which means that nobody's going through the Red Sea. Not nobody, but there's definitely caveats, this, that, and the other thing. But it's substantially blocked off. Uh, and it's, it's humiliating. Uh, so we just don't talk about it. 
And <laughs> let's just not let's just not let mention the Houthis. And I think that not mentioning the Houthis or pretending the Houthis are something that they aren't, or pretending that they are weaker than they are, uh, is a is a really ongoing theme of the past decade, really. I'd say the past 20 years, but uh, it's really only in the past decade, the past uh, 13 years that they were, they have been truly powerful on the international stage. Uh, but really for 20 years, uh, back when the Houthis were just a problem uh, for Yemen's dictator, there's been this consistent theme of underestimating them and not really understanding how appealing they might be, how powerful they might be, uh, how much they can get away with. There is a preliminary note I would like to point out. Uh, uh, this is some comments that I got recently. I, I am not a fan of the Houthis. I would like to make that very clear <laughs> at the outset. What I am is impressed by the Houthis and troubled by the Houthis, uh, getting to the point where I'm a little terrified by the Houthis. Uh, as somebody who is a fan of U.S. interests in the Middle East to some extent and Used to be before October seventh, more of a more concerned uh, about Israel. I'm really, really troubled by the fact that this movement has been as successful as they have been, and I think that makes it all the more important that we spend more time studying it and understanding the extreme Yemeni government, Saudi government, and U.S. government missteps that brought the Houthis to the stage of power that they're at uh, right now. It's vitally important. The Houthis are a. I think that. There's a lot of investment on the part of overzealous fans of Israel and certainly the Israeli government as well to conflate all opposition to the Israeli state with anti-Semitism. The Houthis are not uh, the Houthis are not subtle about their no. anti-Semitism. <laughs> they are not. That they, they, they're not in some kind of gray zone here where we should. Oh well, is let's, that what it says on their flag? It, essentially, ex exactly, Rory. Like it is on their flag. It is death to America, death to Israel, uh, a curse upon the Jews. It, you know, it's incumbent on me as a, a bit of a prick to point out that in fact this is l a less anti-Semitic vision than that of the Israeli government and Joe Biden. Because they do admit on this flag that Jews and Israel are two different sets of things that should be treated differently. And Joe Biden won't do that. The Israeli government won't do that. IPAC won't do that. So I'd actually argue that Joe Biden and IPAC are more anti-Semitic than the Houthis in that respect. However, that's just me being a prick. These guys have a flag that says a curse upon the Jews on it. That is, that's, that's real anti-Semitic. That is not, uh, com you know, there's a lot of leeway for uh, and a lot of i think understanding on my part and of most people who read that pretty extreme anti-israel rhetoric is going to be something you're going to see across the middle east because of historic uh, antagonisms uh historic by the way over the past 80 years not thousands of years of history which is uh, not not a uh something i want to fall into the houthis are explicitly anti-semitic i didn't I haven't done as much research on this as i'd like specifically today but my understanding is that there is a very small, tiny Jewish population left in Yemen that has been victimized by the Houthis. Uh, this is in marked contrast to Iran that is very virulent with its anti-Israeli rhetoric, but still has a Jewish population that is, uh, you know, also a much smaller than it once was, but a Jewish population that is very careful to protect and not persecute in certain ways. So yeah, the Houthis are an anti-Semitic movement. I am not a fan of the Houthis. Uh, what the Houthis are, however, is fascinating. I'm fascinated by the Houthis because the level of success that they have had against the richest petro state in the world, Saudi Arabia, and now against the United States Navy is quite shocking and also completely irrational. If the United States, if the Saudi government, if the Yemeni government as was that used to exist, used any of the massive resources at their fingertips in a more appropriate way. There is no reason why the Houthis should be as successful as they have been. It's just, it is a calamity of errors that has led to a profoundly unattractive movement, getting to a point of uh, serious international power. And if you believe, as I believe, and as we will talk about more next next episode, that the 
Saudi government is on the cusp of falling. The Egyptian government is on the cusp of falling. It's really dark to see one of the most motivated and put together elements in the region as the region is falling apart being the Houthis. Uh, the Houthis are eager to work with other elements, are eager to inspire other elements to a very, very limited degree, less so than is claimed by many folks. The Houthis have been influenced to some degree by the revolutionary Iranian government that took power in 1979. Hezbollah in Lebanon has absolutely been uh, heavily influenced by uh, that Iranian government that took power in 1979. So if we're in a position where like the most of the region is about to fall apart again, we really don't want the most heroic and successful looking Arab movement to be the Houthis. But that's where we are right now. So are they winning the current civil war that's going on in Yemen? Oh, they won a long time ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's okay. Well, I guess that's the first misconception that we should probably address. Uh, the Houthis are the government of Yemen. They have been the government of Yemen for a decade. So no Republic of Yemen? No Southern Transitional Council? These are uh, entities that kind of exist. Now, I mean, And I think that's a really good point there, bringing up those two entities there. Nominally, there is a Republic of Yemen. There is actually still a Republic of Yemen, and most of its institutions are controlled by the Houthis. There is a internationally supported government that claims the name of the Republic of Yemen, but if you look at a map of Yemen, they don't even contr not control. So the Houthis, what I say, uh, main, what I maintain makes them the government of Yemen is the fact that they have, they do control, and they have controlled for a decade, 70% of the population of Yemen. It, it's more compact on a map. If you don't know where the deserts are, it can look like, oh, they've just got a little bit of Yemen. But it's, they control all the places where all the people live. There are like two city, two major cities that they don't control, uh, one of which is uh, Aden and one of which is Taiz, which they are currently besieging. So they sort of control part of it. If they take Taiz, if they take Aden, they've pretty much got 80 to 90 percent of the population of the country. They have 70 percent of the population of the country now. Now, the Republic of Yemen, the government of Yemen that Saudi Arabia is nominally supporting, doesn't even control the, much of the stuff that the Houthis don't control because of a number, a, a good deal of infighting between Saudi Arabia and the UAE and the various militias that they support. The Southern Transitional Council, which is again not really the Republic of Yemen, controls Aden, which is the biggest as a city, the biggest non Houthi city by far. And then you've got these large desert areas, Hadramaut. It's also quite mountainous as well. Well, the mount I, I, th I think the, the, the parts that the Houthis control are more mountainous, and that's oh, yeah, sort yeah. of but why... Oh, yeah, but there is quite mm. a lot of mountains throughout Yemen. It isn't just like flat, you know, desert as we quite often imagine. It is a, it's a difficult place to tr uh, navigate, I would say. It is a difficult place to navigate, Rory, and it is a difficult place to control. And I'm quite sympathetic to Southern aspirations, for some degree of autonomy or independence from the north. They've been, they were autonomous for decades or even centuries up until 1990. So rather they were in an independent country and they've been really abused by the north since then. I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. But a valid point that's been coming up over and over again in my recent research is that if the south were to become independent, it probably wouldn't stay together. So anyway, just yeah. uh, this this is pointing to it's because... already an incredibly poor region with even less resources and less oil and stuff. So yeah, to break away would be even more difficult. Yeah, well, Aden. I mean, Aden at least has the potential to be rich. It's mm. historically one of the great great port cities of the world, frankly. But then there's all of these sort of tribal areas that are. Well, there's a lot of tribal areas in northern Yemen, but they're all sort of packed together and it's like interaction and whatnot. You've got a lot of places in southern Yemen where very few people live. Uh, and each one of these governance going out into these deserts and mountains that you've been referring to have their own groups that are aspiring to be governments. And the Southern Transition Council, which is based in and controls Aden, is unlikely to be able to retain control of all these groups. We have a really great indication of this right now because after a decade of holding on to a internationally recognized president 
who had been elected for a two-year term in 2012 and then resigned and lived in Saudi Arabia for most of that period, the Saudis and the UAE put together a presidential leadership council. This is the nominal leadership of the internationally recognized government. And they have already been fighting uh, between each other. They're incapable of running. They're incapable of running any of the the area of Yemen that is free of the Houthis, period. They're just not good managers. And they're incapable of running it together in any kind of unified way. Because this is still quite a, a sizable country, just to give a context. It's the 50th largest country in the world, slightly smaller than France and slightly larger than Thailand. So oh, it's huge. It's yeah. a very large place, but incredibly, as you say, sparsely populated with, you know, mountainous deserts to look forward to. So I think it's important to emphasize that the government of Yemen, to the extent that it has a government, mm-hmm. is and has been the Houthis. What happened in 2015 was the Saudis invaded because the Houthis had taken over everything that mattered. They had actually taken Aden. Wasn't there a worry that uh, this uh, tension would spread over to Saudi Arabia? Was is that their justification? Well, the certainly the well, I guess we should. That's probably a good way to 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 segue into getting to the origin of the Houthis, because the Houthis come out of resentment of Saudi Arabia and extreme anger at what Saudi Arabia was doing to Yemen. So obviously Saudi Arabia is not going to be, as you say, is not going to be very happy to have all of Yemen controlled by a group that's origin. It may not be on their flag. Uh, They're talking about death to America and death to Israel because that's what good marketing was in 2002, 2004, uh, when we're talking about the origins of this movement. But really it's about resentment of Saudi Arabia and resentment of the Wahhabization, the radicaliz- the Sunni radicalization that the Saudis were imposing on mm-hmm. Yemen. I think it can. I think in the past I've been guilty of overstating the demographic representation of Zaidi Shias. So the Houthis are Zaidi Shia, which is very different from the Iranian version of Shia. In fact, Zaidi Shia is much closer to Sunni practice. So okay. that's sort of the, the really sad thing here is that Sunni and Zaidi Shia traditionally don't have much trouble with each other at all. And in fact, they would actually worship in the same mosques. It was just sort of a, a minor technicality difference in theology that would probably be handed down with your village or tribal affiliation and it, whatever. It just didn't matter that much until the 1980s when with U.S. encouragement, the Saudis started radicalizing every Sunni... Well, actually, this, the, the Saudi radicalization of every Sunni adherent and any Shia they could get their hands on goes back a, a little further, say the 1960s or whatnot, but it really stepped up in the 1980s with the war in Afghanistan. Muslim populations across the Arab world and beyond were heavily, heavily marketed this idea of Afghan jihad. And Yemen was closest to uh, Saudi Arabia. Yemen, this incredibly poor place, right next to this incredibly, even in the 1980s, incredibly wealthy place, Saudi Arabia, was one of the happiest hunting grounds for jihadis that would be convinced to fly over to Afghanistan. And at this point, I mean, the the whole Yemeni government, even uh, the dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh, who we're going to talk about a lot today, uh, who was born Zaidi and still claimed uh, Zaidi adherence for the rest of his life, was eagerly saying, yes, 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 we have to go do this uh, jihad or what have you. So what would happen is, be they Sunni, be they Zaidi Shia, what have you, these, these folks would be convinced to go. And then they would go to Afghanistan and they would be part of sort of Al-Qaeda adjacent Mujahideen uh, ideology and would come back fervent, fervent Wahhabi believers. And this was just one part of the Saudi influence on Yemen. They were funding mosques. They were funding religious centers that all pushed a very heavy Wahhabi or Salafi or however you want to put it, basically an interpretation of Sunni Islam that did not concede that any other interpretations were okay. And the Zaidi Shia, who had run Yemen for a thousand years up until 1970, 
and had definitely been sort of kicked out of power, or civil war across the 1960s, what have you, and had been very discredited by their association with the, the royal family or whatnot, are now in this position where they're not only kicked out of power, and this does represent uh, of North Yemen, maybe 50% of North Yemen and 35% of the country as a whole. There has not been a religious census in 50 years, so nobody really knows. But they're told that, okay, not only you're no longer in charge of the country, and actually you are heretics and you can't even practice your religion that way anymore. So initially, uh, and this is actually one of the great tragedies of the, uh, about the emergence of the Houthis, which are a very, I don't want to go as far as to say anti-democratic, but they simply, you know, there are not going to be elections to choose who's going to be in charge of Yemen under Houthis. Uh, Yemen actually had a pretty vibrant democratic history. It was roundly abused by Ali Abdullah Saleh, the dictator from 1970s. I can never remember if it's 78 or 79, uh, up until 2012. But there were regular elections. There were parties with real differences and real agendas. And in the 1980s, there was an initial attempt to put together through uh, broader movements, I believe they were called the Believing Youth or what have you, and a couple political parties that actually sat in the parliament, the, the great martyred Houthi, Hussein al-Houthi, the guy who was killed in 2004 and sort of is part of the launching of the movement, actually sat as a member of parliament in Yemen. This was a semi-functioning democracy, which is another uh, kind of profoundly disturbing thing to think about when we realize where we've arrived. So... Throughout the 80s, the Wahhabi influence grew, and it actually got worse in the 1990s because Yemen had just reunified. Saleh needed thugs, essentially. He needed people who were going to enforce his will, who were going to make sure that this democratic system that he had had to concede to get the South to join in wouldn't actually function that way. And the thugs that he opted for were the returning veterans from Afghanistan. So they were the Sunni, Sunni jihadists who not only loathed the communists of the South, but also wanted to go around. This is something they would actually do is they would, they would destroy graveyards. And this is something that the Saudis would do a lot. You know, any kind of historic terrorism? implementation. <laughs> hmm? You know, you could call it a form of terrorism. Absolutely. Any kind of historic uh, exercise of Islamic identity that was not rigidly Quran-based was to be destroyed. And this is, I mean, his, Yemen is a, a country with actually much, much, much deeper and more interesting history than Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia is. And to have this Saudi ideology come in and say, okay, now we're going to just knock down anything that isn't, it was enraging. And by the end of the 1990s, elements, uh, specifically the Houthi family, uh, because it is initially a family, start deciding that uh, they're not going to take it anymore. And of course, 9-11, you know, throws fuel onto the fire. Uh, Saudi Arabia obviously uh, doesn't want an anti-Wahhabi movement uh, attaining power. 9-11, the United States didn't really care about the Houthis much for the first decade. We cared about Al-Qaeda. That's what we cared about. Uh, so we wanted to just keep bombing Yemen. We wanted to keep bombing Yemen, and we wanted Saleh to help us keep going after al-Qaeda. Over the course of the 2000s, this became less and less of a priority uh, for Saleh. Uh, first, because he realized that when he was successful against al-Qaeda, as he initially was in the aftermath of 9-11, counterterrorism money stopped coming. And he really wanted it. So it's kind of crazy. He gets embarrassed at a meeting in November 2005 in Washington, D.C. He goes to Washington, D.C. expecting to be congratulated for all his victories against al-Qaeda, and the Bush administration is like, well, thanks. Now we're worried about your corruption. And then <laughs> strangely, in February of 2006, there's a massive prison break, and all the al-Qaeda people he'd arrested escape and uh, start carrying out attacks again. So it's, I don't think it's ever been conclusively documented that Saleh was, that Yemen's dictator was uh, responsible for this jailbreak. Yeah, he's, he becomes a lot less concerned with al-Qaeda and becomes more and more concerned with the Houthis, who kind of get to the heart of his own legitimacy, because he's a Zaydi Shia, and he doesn't like being told he's not Zaydi Shia enough because of things that he's done that are kind of the, the, the heart of his 
power, which is basically kowtow to the Saudis and kowtow to the United States. The Houthis started out that that set of slogans on their flag was a key part of their before they were a military resistance movement. That was a act of civil disobedience to say those things, being anti-American and anti-Israeli and yes, anti-Semitic. That was all, despite the fact that Salah's not named there, that was all a very vigorous protest against Salah, the dictator who was perceived as being subservient to these interests. And the fact is that Salah absolutely was subservient to Saudi and U.S. interests in terms of counterterrorism, in terms of allowing this somewhat alien religious fundamentalism into the country. And I just want to say, like, we should have paid attention, <laughs> you know, we should have, we should not have continued to endorse such completely unfitted to Yemeni interests, Yemeni policies, mm -hmm. because it's that just bloody minded sticking to those, those approaches that has ended up creating uh, the Houthi problem. So over the course of the 2000s, there's a series of wars. They call them the Sada Wars uh, after the northern province that is to the traditional Zaydi Shia heartland. And it, it really starts out with the Houthis hiding in caves. And by the end of this six-year process, the Houthis are getting close to besieging the capital of the country. Incredible. That's a little less impressive than it sounds because if you look on a map, You've got Sada, which is where the Houthis come from, the Zaydi Shia heartland. And Sada, the capital of the country, is actually rather close. They're both nestled up in the north. So it's not quite as insane. Uh, but it is pretty insane that this resistance movement that Sala was dedicating all the money that he was supposed to be spending to fight Al-Qaeda, he was dedicating to fighting the Houthis. It, it's pretty extraordinary that the movement was able to be as successful as it was. And it's just another case study in how repression fails. The, he actually had, and this is, this is sort of a how not to win a civil war as a dictator. Uh, he actually had operations that were officially called Operation Scorched Earth. Like in his, <laughs> in his own country. Yes. In his own country. Uh, there were, it's probably less the case now, but if you read... Uh, histories of the the, the Sada Wars. Uh, I'd highly recommend the work of, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce it appropriately, but uh, Mariek Brandt uh, wrote an incredible book about uh, these wars and the rise of the Houthis. And what would happen is, I mean, not nobody really wanted to fight against Salah or fight against America other than this rather small Houthi movement. But the... Yemeni military would come in all guns blazing and kill a bunch of people that had very little to do with the Houthis, with indiscriminate bombing. So especially in a, in a very heavily armed tribal culture where vendetta is a very important sort of blood feud type stuff, uh, the Houthis all of a sudden would find themselves with all of these allies, sometimes even mm -hmm. Sunni allies, uh, against the perfidy okay. of the central government. And, and fundamentally, Salah was wrapped in a way because he couldn't act out in ways that would placate the Houthis because he had to keep catering to Saudi interests and he had to keep catering to U.S. interests. And I think that that just the, I don't think anybody really realized, and I think we're still running away from what a huge monster we have created in the Houthi movement. And just how uh, powerful it is. I don't want to like give impressions of you sort think of they've done the right thing. Are you encourage this behavior? <laughs> no, I, not that impression. But I also don't want to give it an impression of like Houthi omnipotence or whatnot. I, I find it very ir irritating when people talk about how incompetent they are. Like this is not an incompetent well, I've heard movement. Yemen's military is described as the second largest on the peninsula. Like it does seem to be a, a very heavily militarized area and quite intimidating. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, they're all, it is, it is a more heavily, Rory, it is a more heavily armed culture than the United States, if you can believe that. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess there's less paperwork for arms. There is, there is definitely less paperwork uh, for <laughs> arms. Uh, and, and they have serious military resources. The initial importance of Iranian arming 
is overemphasized. By 2015, as we'll get to, the Houthis had managed to absorb significant slices of the Yemeni army. So, And the Yemeni army had been built up by the United States for counter-terror purposes uh, by 2015 for, for 14 years. I've seen some photos of them with American like uh, small arms and stuff. It's just, you know, they seem to have some quite exotic uh, weapons. You wouldn't expect such, uh, you know, what they're always described as like a sort of rebel army, you know, yeah. to have. <laughs> Yeah, yet they can do parades with uh, with Scud missiles and this and the other thing. Uh, so that, but certainly after the Saudi invasion, Iranian funding and Iranian equipping of the Houthis became a larger factor. So they have a serious missile force, as we're seeing in the Red Sea. They have drones. They have, uh, I assume, I don't know that that comes up much in the fighting, but they have tanks. They have. They are a serious military, uh, but. So they are not incompetent. Uh, they've been doing actually a strikingly good job managing Yemen. I mean, to be clear, they're merciless. They are taxing people. They are There are people that are starving to death because the Houthis would rather buy weapons. Similar to the current government of Afghanistan, would you say? Similar in in, in a lot of respects, yeah. yes. There, it's, uh, not, sure. it's not a place mm. that most Westerners would think would be safe and just, is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'm I, I'm not saying, and I'm also saying that the Houthis are they're, they're definitely corrupt in certain ways, but compared to the rest of Yemen, and when you consider the fact that the Saudis and the United States have been trying to destroy them for twenty years now, when you consider how well armed Saudi Arabia is and how it has generally yeah. the, some of the most high tech weaponry yeah. on yeah. earth at their disposal, yeah, yeah. So they're not they're not incompetent, but they're not omnipotent. Like this is a this is a story of mistakes. What's I mean, it's in one of the poorest countries on earth. <laughs> but what it makes me think of, Rory, and this is and this is going to sound incredibly alarmist, uh, but it 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 really does make me think of past historic paradigm shifts. Like it does make me think of kind of like the Mongols roaring out of the steppes that are nominally less civilized, never nominally this. It makes me think directly of, you know, Muhammad and the caliphs riding out of the desert and taking over stuff. The key part of that Muhammad and the caliphs riding out of the desert to take over the known world story is that the Romans and the Persians, the empires that had existed before that, had exhausted themselves on utterly meaningless bullshit. They had basically fought each other ruinously for, I think, half a century. And not to take away from the divine guidance or the or the skills of Muhammad and uh, his, his sort of Arab legions, they were taking advantage of just incredible stupidity on the parts of the powers that were. And I think I do see sort of intimations of that incredible stupidity that could allow these nominally less sophisticated actors to really, I, I am seriously concerned about the possibility that uh, over the next decade, Saudi Arabia could fall and the Houthis could march on Mecca and Medina and well, they just could to all give of a sudden. A bit of credit to that. They have uh, weirdly similar population sizes. Um, yep. I think they're both at around 30 million, something like that. And the, the Yemenis have a, a military that's worth a damn. Yeah. But, well, also the fact um, Saudi Arabia's military being so much more high tech, if there is a breakdown in civil society, that um, infrastructure will break. So it'll be much harder for them to be an effective fighting force. While Yemen is one of the poorest countries on earth, They will be. this will be easy to them. They will be fighting on easy mode if something drastic were to happen, the infrastructure of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's... Uh... So I just, I really think that people should be paying more attention to the Houthis here. So these wars get progressively worse and worse. This is across the 2000s, between 2004 and 2010. By 2008, the Houthis are not quite besieging, but are on in the suburbs of the capital of Yemen. By 2009, they're having border clashes with the Saudis, which prompt the Saudis to, to do their first heavy bombing of Sadat province in Yemen uh, with the encouragement of Ali Abdullah Saleh, the Yemeni dictator. In 2011, we get the Arab Spring. The Houthis are by no means the only unhappy element uh, in Yemen in 2011. Mm -hmm. So they join in the sort of larger coalition that wants to kick Saleh out. 
Sala is a past master of manipulation and staying in power. So he actually manages to sort of, after getting blown up uh, in a mosque and going to Saudi Arabia for medical treatment, everybody sort of assumed that's it. That's the last we'll see of Sala. He shows up again and continues to sort of uh, refuse to leave power. He is eventually, through massive pressure from his Saudi and U.S. patrons, he's eventually pushed out, I believe, uh, I think it's the end of 2011 or the beginning of 2012. And what we get here is a tremendous ma missed opportunity called the National Dialogue Conference. And I think the tremendous mistake here, which is a tremendous mistake that the United States committed all over the Arab world, was expecting the Saudis to be honest brokers, and, and, and not just honest brokers, but expecting them to be the managers and patrons of a democratic transition. So when I think democracy, I think Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Does yeah. Does that does that seem does that seem strange to anybody else that mm. we were asking Gulf monarchs to manage the democratic transition of Yemen? And again, this is tragically this is a country with with some real democratic history across the eighties and the eighties, nineties, and aughts. And wow, did it not work out? Essentially, the huge screw up was that the Gulf entities that shaped the government didn't just shut out the Houthis, they actually also shut out the Southerners that were also angling for more autonomy. I don't think either uh, the Southerners or the Houthis were looking for independence at this point. Everybody was still on board with a unified Yemen. But this National Dialogue Conference, to the extent that it had a result, uh, it had a result that sort of cut out the Houthis. And the Houthis basically just said, screw it, and took over the country. Uh, rather quickly, uh, which is just an indication of just how much power they had managed to build up. And so they took Sana in 2014. This is the capital of the country. And by, I think, February or March of 2015, they had taken Aden, the, the sort of second city of, mm -hmm. of Yemen. And that's the point at which uh, the Saudis and the UAE made their, ma their next mistake which was deciding to invade. So I think it, it's there was absolutely a Yemeni civil war between the Houthis and other elements in Yemen that ended in 2015 with a Houthi victory. At that point, the Houthis became the government of Yemen. And the Saudis and the UAE decided to give Iran their second biggest gift of the century. The, the biggest gift of the century would, of course, be uh, the U.S. choice to take out Saddam Hussein in 2003, the second biggest gift of the century had to be Saudi and UAE invasion of Yemen in an attempt to overthrow the Houthis. The Houthis were not. I've been to many conferences virtually where scholars emphasize over and over and over again, yes, there were always affinities and, the, and, and some friendly words between the Houthis and the Iranians, but before the Saudi invasion in 2015, the Iranians were not significantly arming the Houthis. After the Saudis invaded Yemen, the Iranians started arming the Houthis quite enthusiastically. The, of course, the imbalance here, I, I think the, the estimates are that Iran spent, during the height of the, the Saudi invasion, which largely took place between uh, 2015 and 2021, the... Iranians were spending 50 to 100, maybe $150 million a year. The Saudis were spending 50 to $100 billion a year. But they were spending tens of billions of dollars to lose miserably. Uh, the United Arab Emirates, in a very bloody-minded, sort of short-sighted interpretation of things, can be portrayed as somewhat being successful in this invasion, in that what the UAE wants to do is control ports, and they do sponsor the STC that controls Aden, and they sponsor other militias that control other ports. They've gotten something that they want out of this. The Saudis have just gotten humiliated over and over and over again. I think uh, key points, I wrote down some key dates here. September 10th, 2004, uh, Hussein al-Houthi, is uh, killed. That's sort of like the, one of the launching points in the first Sada war of the Houthi movement. 13 years later, uh, the Houthis kill Saleh on December 4th, 2017. 
a key detail here. So Saleh gives up power in 2012, but in what is seen as one of the greatest mistakes of this negotiating process is that he's allowed to stay in Yemen and maintain his power networks, uh, even though he's nominally out of office. What Saleh does is he decides in 2014, because he too does not like the results of this national dialogue conference, he decides that he's going to team up with the Houthis that he has been fighting for the past decade. So between 2014 and 2017, and this is another example of underestimating the Houthis that I was a part of, between 2014 and 2017, it was actually Saleh and the Houthis that were the government of Yemen. In 2017, uh, Saleh was convinced to by the Saudis and a fair amount of Saudi money to turn against the Houthis. And everybody sort of assumed, well, really, Saleh was the real power in the north. I mean, come on, the Houthis aren't running this military. The Houthis aren't running this government. And the Saudis were like, ah, whew, we, we got it. We're good. And there were a couple days of running battles in Sana'a and uh, Saleh was killed. And his fabled General People's Congress uh, political party and network that was supposedly such a big ally of the Houthis in the north, I think it still exists to some degree. But I was expecting at least some setbacks for the Houthis after they had killed their partner. And there weren't any, really. In, in fact, the, the Houthis sort of continued to, if anything, got, yeah, got stronger. By uh, 2019 is another really key date. Uh, September 14th, 2019 is probably the point. It's not the point at which the Saudi invasion of Yemen ended, but it is the point at which the Saudis realized how badly they had screwed up. The Yemenis with the Iranians or the Iranians with the Yemenis, it's not entirely clear. I'm not even entirely certain the, the missiles actually came from Yemen or that may or may not be. I, I, I haven't gone into the details there, but no question that if the Houthis did carry this out, it was with heavily technical support from the Iranians. But uh, on September 2019, the Houthis blew up a the Abqaiq uh, refinery in Saudi Arabia, taking out 50% of Saudi Arabia's petroleum refining capacity uh, for for a week or so. But what they did, what they did was they demonstrated their capacity to do this, and also Iranian capacity to do this. And actually, this is tremendously important shift for the region as a whole. Saudi Arabia, for decades, was adamant in their hatred of Iran. Uh, that September 14, uh, 2019 attack was very clarifying for Saudi Arabia when they realized that actually, in the context of the kind of U.S.-Iranian war they'd been pushing for for decades, the Saudi oil and gas industry would disappear. <laughs> It would simply be wiped off the face of the map. So there was some back and forth. And at that point, the Saudis began to dial back. The UAE in 2019, I'm not sure if it was before or after Abkaik, basically just uh, pulled out of the war entirely. They'd already gotten their goals. They controlled the ports they wanted. And they realized that they were getting a tremendous negative public relations loss because of their participation in this horrific war. This is the around the point in 2017 or so is when this war got my attention as someone who's still kind of pissed off about 9-11 and, and likes to complain about the Saudis. The fact that it was described, and I think continued to be described until October 7th, as the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Uh, the Saudi UAE invasion of Yemen, 400,000 dead, malnutrition everywhere, history's greatest cholera outbreak, just truly abysmal stuff. So by 2019, the UAE had bailed and Saudi Arabia started looking for a way out. At this point, the Houthis were like, we can double down. And this is, this is I guess, reassuring. Uh, the Houthis actually can fail. And what the Houthis failed to do was take Marib, which was not historically a large, uh, largely populated region of Yemen. It's where the oil industry is. It's out in the desert where the oil industry is. But it is actually, I believe, highly populated now because there's a large IDP population, uh, internally displaced refugees. A lot of people in Marib. And 2019, when the it was very clear that the UAE pulled out, the Saudis were looking for a way out, uh, the Houthis decided they were going to take Marib, and they spent two years failing to take Marib. Uh, incredibly costly for the Houthis. They could not figure out how to get get this territory. 
they made some progress and some very serious progress in 2021. The Saudis and the UAE decided we're not going to let this happen, quickly pushed them back. And in response, the Houthis bombed both Saudi Arabia and the UAE in a matter of months. And that was kind of the end of the Saudi UAE invasion in 2021, because it, that was the point at which the Houthis, these guys who had mm -hmm. been in caves 15 years prior, had established military deterrence. They had established a principle that if Saudi Arabia or the UAE bombs Yemen, we'll bomb you back. Uh, and that is the point at which the war kind of ended. Uh, you might and have recalled- they seem to have a significantly lower tolerance for, you know, being attacked back. You know, these yes. are one of the richest people in the world and they're not going to put up with, you know, uh, even a small number of dead while Yemen, not that it wants to, but it sort of just has to due, through to its um, incredibly bad luck throughout history. As, as an ex extraordinarily odd salient detail, I think the Houthis bombed Jeddah during a Formula One race or something along those lines, which is just an indication of just how soft a target Saudi Arabia actually but is. But also just the complete difference between these two nations. One has like mass child starvation yeah. and the other one's hosting the F1. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And But which one's winning militarily is the, is the, the important question. Uh, I mean, what, what better indication of sort of Saudi decadence that they're having these formula. I mean, if you were if you were gonna write a polemic piece about the Yemeni conquering of Saudi Arabia, I mean, what better than uh, as the Saudis got prepared for their Formula One race? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Ibrahim in in Sada province prepared his missiles. Uh, I just yeah, it uh, it's uh, it, it writes itself practically. Uh, so that's, oh, and just as a side note, uh, people love to talk about how China brought Iran and Saudi Arabia together, which is nonsense. This actually... Well, because China rules the world now. Did you not know that? Of course. Of course. Is America, what, number three power in the world? India's overtaken them? <laughs> it was not, in fact, China that or the United States that brought Saudi Arabia and Iran together. It was the Houthis, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of where things stood. And another vulnerability here is the Houthis have gotten tremendous legitimacy, recruitment, legitimate international support and admiration out of standing up against the Saudi invasion of Yemen. The Saudi invasion of Yemen ended in 2021. I think there was, a, there was a, about six months of organized ceasefire in 2022. Those ceasefire lapsed technically, but doesn't really matter because the Saudis know that if they bomb Yemen, they'll get bombed back. So even though there, there's not formally a ceasefire, the war mostly ended in 2021, 2022, which means the Houthis actually have to, had to start focusing on minutia of government. It remained obvious that they were better at government than anybody else in Yemen. But now that the Saudis weren't bombing anymore, they didn't have that instant legitimacy of you're fighting off this invader and it became more of a question of like, why aren't we getting paid? Why does oil cost this much? Why can't I feed everybody? Why aren't the ports open? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the Houthis began to look a little more shaky. I think there's a lot of people who are invested in making the Houthis look shakier than perhaps they were, but it was unquestionable that the government of Yemen was becoming more of a challenge for the Houthis when they made it out of wartime. And this is, of course, the point at which Israel and the United States gave the Houthis an extraordinary gift. This is the extraordinary gift of October 7th and the horrific ongoing extermination program that Israel has been running in Gaza ever since. Uh, by the end of 2023, the Houthis announced that Israeli shipping would no longer be allowed through the Red Sea until there was a ceasefire. And I believe since then they've gotten a little more indiscriminate uh, and will now mm, yeah. fire I think there on have most... been deaths since, I think it was a there have been deaths for sure. crew members killed. But they've gotten indiscriminate in the sense of they're not just going after Israeli shipping anymore. They're, they're essentially saying... It, yeah, it's just whoever's in the region that they can get near. Did they fire at an American ship recently? I think like a few days ago. USS Mason. way that this was reacted to in the West was that there's a famous, famous tweet. Can't remember who sent it, but someone was like, ha, the Houthis are about to find out why the U.S. doesn't have health care. 
Because, you know, like we, the, the implication being, we've got this amazing military that's going to smack the crap out of these guys or whatever. Uh, speaking as somebody who has been following the Yemen issue for quite some time, that was not my expectation because I was aware that we have been attempting to militarily smack the crap out of the Houthis for 20 years, if not the United States directly only since 2015 or so, but as the Saudis since 2004. And that has failed. And that has, again, failed. There is some talk of, oh, we're going to, I think we have actually jacked up the designation of the Houthis as some level of terrorist, which makes it harder yeah. to feed the Yemeni public. That's not going to do anything. There's been an embargo against the Houthi government in Yemen for 15 years, almost a decade now. The bombing's not going to work. The embargo's not going to work. What is going to work, what could work, is actually getting a ceasefire in Gaza, which all of humanity would prefer. But the damage, I fear, has already been done. The Houthis are not going to lose this legitimacy. There's a series of conferences on Yemen that I, that I go to, and because of the vagaries of sanctions, it, these conferences are mostly academics uh, and politicians that are not affiliated with the Houthis. Uh, so it's always a little bit skewed against the Houthis, these conferences I go to that the most recent one I attended, it was really, really marked. Just absolutely everybody there was like, wow, the Houthis are so much more popular. They are much more popular in the regions they control. They are much more popular in the regions they do not control. As appalling as we find that anti-Israel and anti-Semitic flag that they wave, we need to recognize that, especially in the context of no peace process, attempted genocide against the Palestinians, that's a really, really popular mandate. And that was just marketing for the Houthis until October 7th. Now they are carrying out real actions against Israel, against the United States, and in defense of the Palestinians. Well, if you consider how appalled like just so many civilians in America are, just think what they're feeling in Yemen for this. Yeah, yeah, it, it's uh, exactly. And it, it is giving them extraordinary legitimacy. I wouldn't be terribly surprised if we saw more over the next year, we saw uh, more Yemeni moves to consolidate, more Houthi moves to consolidate. The Saudis seem to have gotten out of the way. Uh, and actually, uh, this is kind of an interesting way for the Saudis to turn the tables on the UAE. The UAE has basically used its militias to destroy all of Saudi Arabia's militias, uh, anti-Houthi militias. So the Saudis seem to be very eager to just start working with the Houthis, which would uh, be very bad for the United, United Arab Emirates and would be very bad for any non-Houthi elements in Yemen. Um, so that's a possibility going forward. It's an absurd thing. And actually, you kind of think the Saudis might want to learn from Ali Abdullah Saleh, actually, because Ali Abdullah Saleh fought with the Houthis for a decade, and then he allied with the Houthis, and then the Houthis killed him. The Saudis have fought against the Houthis for 20 years, are now attempting to ally with the Houthis. Do I need to? <laughs> so it's interesting, uh, because I have certainly, uh, during the Saudi UAE invasion of Yemen, I found myself quite uncritically rooting for the Houthis. Uh, now I'm in a situation of being quite disturbed by the Houthis. But I think we have to recognize the extent to which U.S. and Saudi policy brought this about. With the Arab Spring in 2011, we saw all over the region, we saw very real attempts in most countries. The standard bearer was the Muslim Brotherhood, which is not, in fact, a terror organization, which is a, a loose affiliation. There absolutely are Hamas terrorists that are loosely affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. But the Muslim Brotherhood stood for Arab democracy. Uh, that's what they tried to do over and over again in Tunisia. That is what they tried to do in a Moroccan parliament, a Kuwaiti parliament that I think has just been uh, shut down or what have you. Uh, that's what they tried to do in Egypt, where we, the United States, Saudi Arabia, the other Gulf monarchies, supported a, a coup against that Egyptian government. So we've got a whole bunch of serious attempts at Arab democracy that were brutally crushed over the past decade by the United States and Saudi Arabia. So this is kind of what we're left with. The Houthis are appalling. It is 
very damaging and like you know puts visions of falls of empires and falls of governing paradigms to see the Houthis gain more and more power into my head. But it's the U.S. and Saudi Arabia's insistence on dumbass ideas of counterterrorism, dumbass ideas of the status quo, preserving Arab monarchy for some reason. I get why the Saudis are invested in that, but why is the U.S. so invested in that? So the Houthis are horrific, but they are also the result of a series of really dumb military first approaches by the United States and Saudi Arabia. And I think that if we are going to have any hope of a more democratic next step for the Middle East, we need to stop gravitating towards these military first approaches. If we do get peace in Yemen, and I think to some extent the Houthis have been obstructing a real peace in Yemen because they want to keep this, they know that they want to keep the war going. And Gaza has been this tremendous gift to them. And if we allow them to keep the war going, they're just going to continue, as they have been for 20 years, getting stronger and stronger and stronger. The only possibility of stopping the Houthis is some kind of sustained peace. If the Houthis came to you and says, look, we want to be seen as, you know, the credible government of Yemen, what should we do? What would you tell them? Well, I, I would say they are the credible government of Yemen. I, oh, yeah, but internationally, they're still not recognized as the government. I think the 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 first steps would be easy. Would be to negotiate over Taiz. This is a uh, I don't know if it's the somewhere at the top five cities in Yemen. It's a significant industrial city in Yemen that has been maintained. It, it there's sort of you could say the Houthis are besieging it. I believe there are battle lines around or within the city. Uh, I think a, a a step that the Houthis could take that would demonstrate to everybody that they were serious about, not just about sort of negotiating with the Saudis, getting their subsidies to take the rest of the country, but to demonstrate that they actually do want peace would be to do some kind of, attain some kind of negotiated settlement over Taiz, I think would probably be the first step uh, that they, they should take. I don't expect that. In fact, I I'd, I'd think it'd probably be more likely to see over the next year a renewed attempt by the Houthis to take Taiz because they, you know, they're, they look like heroes now. We should maybe pay more attention to that. Thank you very much for listening and we hope to catch you next time. Cool beans. The More Freedom Foundation is also available on YouTube and TikTok. Rob's Twitter is Rob O'Law and he's also written a book called Avoiding the British Empire, What It Was and How the US Can Do Better and music provided by Kevin MacLeod.